So obviously you do your own art, which is your own release. Mm. Do you view other people's art? I've, I've tried, to be honest. Um, I don't get a lot from galleries. I find it quite, I won't say boring, but it doesn't spark anything. Uh, films a lot, I watch a lot of films, um, a lot of sort of cinematically pretty films like Midsummer, that kind of thing, the new one that came out not too long ago. That's good. I got a lot of inspo from that. And um, that's where the skin came from when I was doing the skin for some art. Um, I do like some artists like um, Goya, Chapman's, that kind of thing. Just artists that have got a bit of a mm. kind of to them, rather than a stoic picture of like fine art that you find around galleries. It's not, I get a bit bored to be honest. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, I do, I do look at other people's stuff and take things from it. Like I would never do anything like Herman Nitsch on the wall. I'd never do anything like that, but I loved the background that he could do something so grotesque and have people want to see more. Mm -hmm. It was quite reassuring. <laughs> it was reassuring for the blood smile. It means that there positively is somebody out there who's, you know, weird like me. So <laughs> I'll just be out somewhere and think of something and think, oh, write it down because I've got a memory like, I've got a memory like a goldfish and I can't always remember what's gone on. So I literally pick something and I'll be like, oh, that's a good idea. I'll do that. And then I'll start it and then it'll turn into something completely different. I'm like, do you know what? So we'll, we'll leave it there. But I don't really have much of a, of a process. I don't have much of a political view or anything like avant-garde. I'll just, just do whatever it's like. Good. So are there any mediums that you haven't started using that you, or haven't used that you think? I've, I've used everything. Um, I've done wood sculpture. I started to carve a little wooden lass and then I thought, you know what, it's not for me this. Um, I've start, I've, I use clay. I've used oil clay at the minute. Um, I don't think there's anything. Probably like print screening is the only thing I've not done. What about blood? I have used blood. <laughs> I have, funnily enough. Believe it or not. Um, I was doing one of those, it, again, it was after COVID. They give you these little things where you need to like prick your finger and yeah, the after bit situation. And I literally was like, I wouldn't stop bleeding. I was like, I'm letting this go to waste. So I said to my husband, I was like, chuck us that canvas. And he was like, why was I just chuck it up? So I literally bled and he was like, it's just luck to me. And I was like, was, um, there was an artist who used his own blood, froze it, and like, um, in the shape of his own head. It, yeah, it's intense. Yeah. I can't see, that's too much effort for me. <laughs> I go really woozy. If I lose that much blood, man, no, I'm yeah. out of it. It's not, it's not happening. <laughs> a lot of it is quite lazy art, especially the ones that's got more of a... The, the more blood textures and um, the ones that I've got which are more detailed can literally take anything like a week, two weeks, but the ones that I'm experimenting with, they literally take probably about, I think that took us about 20 minutes because it is literally just a really quick medium. It's nothing that's perfect. I'm still in an experimental mode of just figuring out what I want to do. So a lot of it is really, really quick art, which is great because it's, you know, can get a bit labor intensive at times. So <laughs> yeah, it was the lips that took the longest. Because if you look, the hair is literally just quick strokes. Yeah. The nose hasn't got any detail in it. I, I prefer doing things like that because it's, I like doing my blood, don't get me wrong. And I did a picture of my mum that she absolutely hates, so it's still up there and I'm keeping it forever in a day. But no, nah, I, I quite like the more, if I think about things too much, it gets a bit, it loses something. That is, that one's called I'm Just So Bloody Happy. And it's pretty much what it says on the tin. I got some, um, just some fake blood from Halloween and I create drawings with it, um, the same as my first down there. I literally create pictures um, and then paint them to try and get a little bit more depth, move things around, move the shadow around so it gives a bit more of a story. Same with that one, I just made it a bit more bloody and it's got a bit more froth bits to it because I was trying to make it a bit more lively and a bit more textured. So the photo looks quite dull, quite boring, so I've just added a few extra bits and tried to make it a little bit more a little bit prettier, because, you know, it's so happy. I'm so fascinated with it. It's the same as, um, I've, I, got, I got really drunk and we were having a chat about life and death. Um, and we came up with a quote, which was something like, um, why does a skull represent death when it's the one thing that's keeping you alive? It's the same thing as blood. It is the one, people are like, oh yeah, I love life. I want to stay alive and all that. But they're terrified if something spills out. It's... I find it fascinating, I love the colour, I love the consistency. Don't get me wrong, I'm not going to go out and start Jeffy Dahmer and everyone, but I just find it a really, really nice thing to look into. It's something that's always overlooked, but it's something that's so important to us, the same as organs. Like, if we didn't have a heart, we'd be dead. However, if somebody sees a heart, like, I don't want to look at it. I'm like, well, you, you need to. 
it's literally it's it's the one thing that's keeping you alive like and i just i, I think because i'm not particularly nice to look at i think i focus on things that need to be looked at a bit nicer if that makes sense so stuff that's overlooked all the time i try and bring that to life a little bit more yeah so that's the that's the piece that we based on bulimia um i was trying to take something that people find a lot of joy in and turn it around so they can see how i kind of see it as absolutely disgusting no that's um that's the one so literally again it's the more kind of linked with the blood the whole gelatinous highlights darks and i i quite enjoy jelly um i found out i've got a problem with the jelly of my heart so there's one that i did which was a bit of a mick take and it was literally like an open chest cavity and it was haribo <laughs> instead of an actual human heart that, that one believe it or not is um it's for part of my next project we've been looking at professionalism in artwork and to be quite honest i don't know what i want to do when i leave uni i originally did want to be an art therapist and then there's still doubts in the backs of my mind that thinks that's never going to happen for me, which is fine. You just tend to live your life and see where things lead. I can't see myself becoming a gallery artist and selling my artwork. I don't think that's on the cards for me. So I literally looked around at places that are selling art, so home organs, B&M, that kind of thing, the more decoration. And I noticed that every single one has three bits. They have like some sort of weird phrase that makes no sense. They have pop culture. And then they have some sort of like gimmick, like um, gesso or those little resin bubbles on things. So I literally combined all those three and created a piece. So it's got the words from the actual film, it's got the gesso from the book, and then it's got the pop culture of the giant eye. But the way I've done it is that the first thing you notice isn't the thing that took us about an hour and a half. It's the thing that took us about 20 minutes with all the writing on, and that's the point of it. A lot of the times that is overlooked. And people just want it as a decoration, they're not bothered about what it is and what it means. So that was my one, we had a group project um, to do, and again, I didn't want to do anything that was too weird, too whatever this is. Because it was a group and it, I felt that though it's, people's not into that, so I'm going to tone it down. So I looked at um, the zombie fungus, the one that mimics a creature when it takes over. So I decided to use a mannequin um, and literally dressed her up in how you'd sort of leave a body and it's got all the fungus growing around her and it's only when you kind of look at it that you realise it's a body, you don't see that first thing. And I think that's what I like to do, I like to kind of mess around a little bit and when people kind of look at it and then they're real and they're like, oh shit, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Quite yeah. nice. I'm Sam, I'm a freelance director in the sports media sort of live field of television but also I'm a lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire specialising in media and television production. I use creative outlets to help with my mental health, mostly to sort of get me out of my mind really. Um, sometimes if I've got lots of going on, lots going on in my head and I sort of need to get away from it, I just do things creative, maybe go out take some photos, you know, uh, go out and film something, get, in, get deep into an edit. And not only does it help just because it's creative, but also it just takes my focus away from whatever is going on in my head, really. So, yeah, being distracted by something creative really helps me sort of pull myself back to, to where I am and, and, and centre myself. I feel like the media industry is, is lacking on sort of talking about mental health. If you think sort of five, ten years ago, I think we've come a long way. But I still think we're lacking, especially with, with sort of males and mental health. Um, men are still sort of stereotypically pushed to, to be quiet about what they do um, and I feel like the media needs to do it more. They are doing a lot better, don't get me wrong, but I think more needs to be done, especially with, with sort of helping men open up about mental health and, and, and appreciate that you don't have to be manly to hold it back in. You, you, if, if you need to talk about it, you need to talk about it and I think we're getting there but we're not quite there yet. In my job as a lecturer, I'm lucky that I get to work with sort of the generation below me, those sort of born between 2000 and, and 2005 and they're really lucky in that they've grown up in a society where it really is okay to talk about their mental health and and I think that's really good because it, it allows me to sort of take part of that as well if they're so open in, in class and also with me out of class talking about their mental health it makes it feel like it's okay for me to do the same um, and I try and take that home and, and, and take that into my life as well um, because as I said before, the media and, and society as a whole it is, is sort of lacking 
in that. So to have this younger generation that, that sees it as okay, helps me to see that it is okay to talk about it. And, and we do have conversations in class and out of class that it is sort of between all of us. And, and I think that really has helped my mental health, just being able to talk about it and feel that it is okay. Um, and if this, the next generation that's gonna be ruling the world in, in 20, 30 years time are, are so okay with mental health and, and talking about it and being open about it and, and not hiding away from it, that is just promising, so promising for the future. As part of my final project of my Masters in TV production, I made a documentary called The Village, which focused on the LGBTQ plus history of Manchester. Um, this was really important to me because some of my family are um, gay, so I thought it was very important to sort of learn more about the history of, of, of LGBTQ plus in, in, in Manchester in the Northwest, but also as an ally myself um, with lots of friends that are in the community, I thought it was really important to sort of learn more, but also give out um, as an output to sort of tell this history and in my research as I was going through I made this documentary with my friend Gail um, we learned more than we could ever imagined we thought we knew history but through the people we spoke to and and the research that we did we learned that Manchester is pivotal in how LGBT people are able to live today um, out and proud was, was was one thing that Manchester was really really big for and it was it was great to make that documentary um, but even better to learn as, as we were doing it Thank you.